Good day, people. We're here to talk about the concept of multisensory integration. So if we break down that word to have a general overall understanding of what that means, multiple or multi-sensory, so multiple senses. So combining touch, eyesight, vision, uh, auditory cues or hearing, whatever multiple senses that we combine to greater understand what is occurring with the specific phenomena that we're sensing or that we're watching or that we're viewing. <clears throat> what we want to talk about here is how this is very helpful within manual therapeutics of any kind. Obviously, uh, I'm more concerned with osteopathic manual therapeutics, but this is true of any manual therapy. Now, there's three general overall principles when talking about multisensory integration. So one is the spatial rule. It essentially states that multisensory integration is more likely or stronger when the constituent unisensory, so one sense, uh, stimuli arise from approximately the same location. So if you happen to hear a car backfire and you see some smoke, right, you will assume that the, back, the smoke comes from the car backfire. You may not absolutely be sure about that, and that's, this is one of the challenges, is that with multisensory integration, there's the possibility of us tricking ourselves. However, when we do use multiple senses, we seem to get a better understanding, even with the possibility of being tricked. But again, that's a spatial rule, so you, when things happen very close to one another, so you hear the car backfire, and where you believe it backfired, or where you heard it, you see some smoke and you see a car. Those things come together and you believe the smoke came, came from the car backfiring. And we also have the temporal rule. So the temporal rule or principle states that multisensory integration is more likely or stronger when the constituent unisensory stimuli arise at approximately the same time. Okay, so we go back to that example uh, we just talked about of a car backfiring. So if you hear a car backfire, right? You, so you see a, you hear a noise and you see a car. Sounds like a big boom and the car backfires. And then later on you see the smoke. Right? The time is different. Right? There's a, a greater time span. You may not necessarily believe that the smoke came from the car, depending on how much time has elapsed. However, if you see the car, you hear the car backfire, and you see the smoke all in a very short time frame, that is likely to give you that picture that the smoke came from the car backfiring. Now, the final concept, the final principle, is the principle of inverse effectiveness, and it states that multisensory integration is more likely or stronger when constituent unisensory stimuli, right? So the one sense, multiple senses, so vision and and, uh, and hearing coming together at the same time, or each one happening, <coughs> evoke each one of those evokes a relatively weak response when presented in isolation. So we have blurry vision, right? So just say you're somebody who wears glasses, or you have a prescription, and you wear contacts, and your contacts are out, and you're looking for your glasses, or you're looking for your contacts, contacts. Now your, your vision may be weak, so a common strategy is to use palpation, is to use haptic feedback to re reach around until you feel the thing that feels like your glasses or your contacts and in your blurry vision looks similar enough. So when vision is minimal, we'll use another sense. So we may do the same thing with auditory cues. So we understand that when things happen in a similar time frame, in a similar space, or when one sense is essentially dampened, we'll use this concept of multisensory integration. It's just something that's likely to happen as human beings. Now, in osteopathic manual therapy, we are looking to understand what's going on with the patient's body. Now, when we talk about assessment, we have to be honest and say that the only thing we truly assess based on the tests that we perform are motion characteristics. Okay? The palpation that we utilize when we push into tissues, when we move tissues, when we have a patient move themselves, when we passively move a patient's joints, it's motion that we're actually testing. We have to be honest about that. Now because it's motion that we're testing, <clears throat> and because the palpation of that motion, depending on how we do it, may not necessarily be as accurate as we'd like it to be. It may be somewhat crude. It's very likely that vision is going to become quite important to us. Right? So we want to keep our eyes open when we're working. Right? Now we think about this concept and integrate it with other things that we've talked about before. So our fourth concept of patient positioning being we want the anatomy exposed, free to move in the plane required, and preferably visible. And that's pointing to the, this concept of multisensory integration. I'd like to see what's going on. Because palpation alone may be too crude to understand. 
or I may be feeling something and not actually understanding how I'm moving or how my patient's moving. I'm missing information because let's just say I go to push into a tissue, right? Say the tissue's over here. If I go to push into it and want to test its motion characteristics, right? I want to be able to push in a steady fashion. Now, as I push, I do this, I move my, shot, my body in relation to what I'm pushing on, I may believe there's much more motion if my eyes are closed because I moved quite a bit. I want the eyes to be open so that I know I moved in relation to this. So if I'm looking at this as I'm pushing on it, if I move, I can feel like it moved. I can have this trick. I want to see it move. I want to keep my eyes open. Again, we're talking about motion as we assess. Right? So what we want to do is we want to understand also that with palpation, that we know that palpation is somewhat inaccurate. Right? So we look at our concepts of, of palpation. Uh, specificity is not the number one necessity. Movement is. Again, that points to our assessment concepts as well. Move from the known to the unknown. So if you have multiple landmarks to, to kind of move from, you'll better identify a specific structure that you're looking for. Right? And we also want to look at get as much as you can touch. So broad contact for multi-point discrimination or two-point discrimination, however you want to term it. But the concept is that we want to have our search strategy and we want to <coughs> have a way to check what we're feeling. So we want to use vision for that. So the catchphrase that I, come, I, I will utilize for this is keep your hands and your eyes on the prize. So keep your eyes open, your hands on what you're touching. And I would also suggest that I think based on experience uh, as a practitioner and experience teaching students to become practitioners, that vision is actually much more valuable than we like to give it credit for. Because again, if we're looking at what we're doing, we can see the fault with our palpation. If we're just trying to feel, we're going to have a hard time seeing the faults with our palpation or our motion as practitioners. So what we'll do is we'll put a patient on the table and we'll take a look at some of the things that are very easy to do to perform as faults as a practitioner, especially if we're not paying attention with our eyes. So again, the catchphrase that we utilize for multisensory integration is keep your hands and your eyes on the prize because it will give you a better understanding of the motion that you're actually assessing as opposed to the emotion, the emotion that you're creating as a practitioner because you can be going farther than the structure that you think you are testing. And we'll show you some of that on the table. So we're talking about multi-sensory integration and how important it is to use multiple senses. So again, multi, multiple sensory senses. So in the case of osteopathic manual therapy or manual therapeutics in general, my suggestion to most people is to purposely utilize palpation, aka touch, as or haptic feedback, as well as visual feedback. Because without the visual feedback, some people will suggest that over time as a practitioner gets more and more used to it, uh, better at creating mental imagery, that they can improve their palpatory skills or the accuracy of their palpatory skills. Now while that may be true, what opportunity we have here is to miss a lot of things that we may not pick up as well as practitioners uh, that could be bad habits. We'd habituate the bad habit out. So something that I've seen is, say you're going to create a tug or a telescope or uh, traction through the patient's legs. Okay, so what you'll notice is automatically what I do is I put the patient's feet on me. Right? The reason I do that is because I have haptic feedback of the patient's feet on my thigh and on my ASIS. I have haptic feedback from their feet on my forearm, from the lateral portion of their feet. Right? And if I create traction, I just lean back and I don't let space come between me and the patient. Now if I'm creating traction and I do this, I come away, then I can get the impression because I've moved farther than the patient's moved, that the patient is moving in a way that they actually aren't. I'll put my movement on what I believe the patient's doing. Right? So if I want to compare right to left, I can traction the right, or sorry, traction the left leg with my right hand, and then I can traction the right leg with my left hand over here. And I get a comparative. But if I do it like this, if I let the patient's foot come off of me, 
right? Even if I'm looking and I don't see this space, and I come further away on this side, on the right side, on the patient's right side, I can think that I've tractioned them farther on this side, giving myself a false, essentially a, a false reading, because if I keep all of this tight, I keep my arms nice and straight and as relaxed as possible while holding a patient's legs, and I keep the haptic feedback on my forearm bilaterally, on my body, so on my thigh and my ASIS in this case, and this may change depending on the situation, the size of the patient's feet, the size of the practitioner, what have you. I can create traction there. Using my eyes, I look broadly at the whole, the whole region, and while it may not come up on the video, I'm able to better create traction on the left leg of the patient than I am on the right leg. Now, <clears throat> what we'll also see is kind of the, the reverse. When people are pushing into things or creating compression, what they will do is a similar thing, is they'll lean in, and if you watch my shoulder, so that's as far as the patient will move. That's all I need to do to get the patient to move. I just lean in on one side. But what you'll get is people do this. They tip. So if I tip this far on this leg, and I tip this far on this leg, I get different feedback. So I have moved unevenly in relation to the patient. So I've moved my body in relation to my hands. <clears throat> so I think that there's more motion on one side than there is on the other, but it's because of how I've moved. Now, if I keep my eyes open and I watch it, right, if I'm actually kind of, if I pick a point, say we pick the, <clears throat> the seam of the patient's sweatpants, right, just very generally, I don't stare at it, but I use broad vision, just kind of open, open field of vision, and I lean in, right, I can notice that I've deviated farther this way than I have this way. So I, I can hopefully pick up that it's an uneven test. If I can't, then I have a problem. Like, that can be a habitual issue. Right. Another way to show this right, is good old classic uh, internal external rotation of the hip. Right? So if I'm really far away from the patient and I do this and I step, right, because some practitioners are taught to use good footwork and to move their bodies. Now if I step really far this way, right, then I can think, so if you see, if you watch my elbow down here, my elbow open, because I've moved away, my body away from my hand, I can think I've got more motion than I actually do. If I stay in contact with the patient, good contact, I know that it ends there, right? I can feel it in multiple ways, so I can feel the end range uh, through the patient's femur, Right? I've got my forearm here, I've got good contact. Remember we talk about broad contact all the time, I've got good contact. And I don't move my body in relation to my hands. I do that, and that's the end. That's the end of the patient's range, and I can compare that side to side. But the key being that I'm not tricking myself. I've got my eyes open, I see that I'm not moving in relation to the patient. So if I start here, and I do this, right? I'm exaggerating, but if I do this, then I will think the patient moved farther than they did. <clears throat> Another place that this, I've seen this go very awry is when checking the anominates or checking the movement of the pelvis, one side of the pelvis in relation to the sacrum. A generous estimates of motion between the sacrum and the anominate are about two to four degrees. Okay, so what we do is we, many osteopathic practitioners get trained to put a hand on top of the ASIS or the anterior side of the pelvis another hand under and essentially create this rocking motion. Okay. Remember, this is only supposed to move approximately two to four degrees. You have to be extremely sensitive. But what you'll see is things like this. Okay? You'll see people diving in, moving, right? Now if this is only going to move two to four degrees, I shouldn't feel much. If I feel something that feels more like say ten degrees, 20 degrees, then I'm creating something different. Now if you take a look right here, just right about here, there you may see the, the emblem on the patient's sweatpants. What happens if I push like this is not much over there, right? But I'm not going to create enough force to move the anomaly in relation to the sacrum. If I create more force, and you watch that, ideally, hopefully it shows up on the camera, that moves. Now some people would say that that's just the tug of me uh, moving the patient and then pulling on the fabric of his pants. Now, while that may be true, 
but at least I have a visual cue, all things being relatively equal, that instead of moving the anominate in relation to the sacrum, I can move the pelvis in relation to the table, right? So I can get these visual cues. We want to understand what the anatomy is supposed to do. We want to understand how far it, we should expect it to move. We want to keep our eyes open. So again, our, we go back to that catchphrase, keep your eyes and your hands on the prize. So you've got multiple information trying to pick up what's going on. Even if you're a more experienced practitioner, I would very much suggest against closing your eyes because what you can get is ignorance or you would be ignoring your distance, the distance between you and the patient if your arms are opening or closing, so your elbows or your shoulders or what have you. That can be very problematic because what you'll get is essentially false findings. So again, keep your eyes open, use palpation, keep your hands and eyes on the prize.